Good evening. It's uh, a real pleasure tonight to introduce Robert Pape to all of you in preparation for his talk. Uh, Bob Pape is professor of political science here at the University of Chicago. He received his BA from at the University of Pittsburgh, and he actually has his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1988. Professor Pape has taught at the School of Advanced Air Power Studies at Dartmouth College before he returned to the University of Chicago in 1999 as a tenured professor. Briefly, I just want to talk about what Professor Pape's research trajectory has been. Um, there's a lot, so I'm just going to try to break it down into a couple of key categories. I think an overarching interest in Professor Pape's research has been coercion, how states and other armed organizations try to get other states to do what they want them to. His kind of signature achievement in the 1990s was research on coercive air power. In the 1990s, there was a lot of optimism about the uses of air power as a coercive tool. Professor Pape's research articles and then his book, Bobbing to Win, I think powerfully challenged the existing conventional wisdom and was essentially the, the foundational work on air power and coercive um, air campaigns. He also did work on coercion through economic sanctions in the late 1990s, as well as costly moral uh, action in the international sphere. Since 2000 and 2001, Professor Pape's research has focused primarily on what he's going to talk about today, suicide terrorism. But also he's done some fairly important research on unipolarity, basically the dynamics of an international system when there's only one superpower. So his research um, has focused on issues of soft balancing, that is how smaller countries try to deal with the United States and on kind of the general dynamics of the post-Cold War world. Professor Pape has published in a whole variety of journals, the American Political Science Review, uh, where an early version of the first stage of this project appeared, international security, international organization, security studies, as well as in a number of major policy outlets, including Foreign Affairs, The New York Times, and The Washington Post. So I think I'm just going to conclude by pointing out the fact that Professor Pape's research has directly dealt with a variety of very policy relevant issues. In the 1990s, economic sanctions and air power. In the 2000s, the dynamics of unipolarity and suicide terrorism. And I think that's a, a salutary lesson to a lot of academics and scholars uh, who should better integrate research and policy. So on that note, I'm going to introduce Professor Pape and look forward to his talk. Thank you so much, Jamie, Paul, thank you. And thank you all for coming on this really cold Chicago night. It's terribly important that we move beyond the war on terror. Five years ago, Donald Rumsfeld, when he was Secretary of Defense, had the right question when he asked, are we producing more terrorists than we're killing? Well, I think you're going to see tonight, certainly with respect to suicide terrorism, the most important problem, the answer is yes. And the central cause is, in fact, the war on terror itself. But let's just look for a moment at the last year, and especially at uh, what we've done in Afghanistan. Over the past year, we've committed over 30,000 additional troops to Afghanistan and another $100 billion to Afghanistan. Now, just to put that in some perspective, especially the money, that $100 billion is more money than we spend at the federal level on education. Think about that for a moment. That $100 billion is five times the worth of the entire economy of Afghanistan. The World Bank rates it at $22 billion. What have we gotten for our troops and our money? Well, just a month ago, and for those of you that uh, are interested, I'd encourage you to go look at the November 2010 DOD report to Af uh, Congress on Afghanistan. Just go and look at this report. It's a detailed, 150-page, single-spaced report. What do they report? In the last year in Afghanistan, insurgent attacks across the entire country up 73%. The number of Afghans rating that their security is bad, that's the lowest end on the national survey conducted by the DOD, is higher than ever. 
There have also been, in the last year, numerous plots in the United States to kill Americans directly related to Afghanistan, including the Fort Hood shooting spree and the Times Square bomber. It's quite clear we're not getting much security for our money, but why not? And is there a better alternative? Well, tonight, I want to tell you about some exciting research we've been doing at the University of Chicago. And I think it will help answer some of these questions. The focus of this research is on suicide terrorism. Why suicide terrorism? Suicide terrorism is the lung cancer of terrorism. It is by far the biggest killer inside that category. The average suicide attack kills 12 times as many people as the average ordinary terrorist attack. And on 9-11, what made it possible for the terrorists to kill 3,000 people? The element of suicide. We know because in 1993, terrorists attacked the World Trade Center, the very same towers, with an ordinary truck bomb, most of you probably don't even know, killing six people. We certainly didn't turn our country upside down over that. We turned our country and our foreign policy upside down over suicide terrorism. That's the key issue that we face and the key thing we need to understand. Moreover, like lung cancer, suicide terrorism is associated with specific risk factors. And like a medical researcher might try to identify those risk factors associated with lung cancer by collecting facts about who gets the disease and who doesn't get the disease looking all around the world, we can do the same thing with suicide terrorism. And as you're going to see, myself and a rather large research team have been pretty much spending <laughs> our days, nights, and lives collecting much of that information. This started uh, mostly in 2003 when I published an academic article on suicide terrorism that happened to include what I didn't realize at the time was the first complete database of all suicide terrorist attacks around the world. It might come as a surprise that that was the first. Uh, I knew when I published the article that no academic or think tank, but what I was surprised about was when I got a call from our Department of Defense. I was told that the Department of Defense, uh, like the British uh, government, didn't begin collecting global suicide st uh, terrorism statistics until after 9-11. They were quite interested in getting a hold of my data, uh, uh, which I gave them. And in return, they provided rather large funding for the update expansion of what I'm about to present for you tonight. Uh, that allowed me to publish a book in 2005, Dying to Win, looking at the global patterns of suicide terrorism up until that point, uh, and then basically to keep going <laughs> with uh, different funders. And not always, by the way, from the Department of Defense. The Carnegie Corporation in New York, Argonne National Laboratories, and the University of Chicago itself have contributed in really powerful ways to make this possible. And I really want to emphasize here tonight that this is true a true University of Chicago project. As you're going to see here, and if you would go and look at the book, you would see that there are major contributors here from the University of Chicago who are graduate students. Even some of our senior undergraduates have contributed in a really powerful way to this project. Um, and it's really quite special to, uh, uh, to see that this is something that really could probably only be done I think at the best research university in the world, uh, the University of Chicago, because it makes it possible to truly challenge this conventional wisdom. Now, when our book came out, the most recent book uh, in October, you might be interested to know, we had a major launch of the book on Capitol Hill. On October 12th uh, last year, we had a big conference all day on Capitol Hill with over 300 people there. Uh, now, on Capitol Hill, you can't actually sell books, so we couldn't do that, but a donor gave away 300 books to every person that walked in that door um, on Capitol Hill, and it was really quite an exciting day. But it was also exciting because that was the first conference by the University of Chicago on Capitol Hill. We had never had one there before. Uh, second key thing, and probably the most important thing, is um, you're going to hear tonight that the policy prescription that comes out of this research is called offshore balancing. Well, what happened at that conference wasn't just myself and other researchers presenting the information, but a lot of folks from Washington came to talk about the research as well. 
One of them was the chief of naval operations. That's the number one officer in the Navy, the leading officer in the Navy, uh, who basically leads 350,000 people. And his talk was entitled, The Navy's Role in Offshore Balancing. That's really quite a thing. He announced at that conference that offshore balancing would be the future policy of the Navy. That was really quite a thing because this really has moved our research from simply the academic world to Washington in a truly major way. And by the way, that was on C-SPAN. You can go and watch the video if you're interested on YouTube, see him for himself. Uh, and that was really quite a day. But what led uh, folks as prominent uh, as the CNO to take this research seriously? Well, you're going to hear some of the patterns and some of the findings, some of which are going to be quite startling to you. So it's not that. <laughs> He's actually having to overcome quite a bit about the patterns. It's something else that's really driving it, and that's what I want to talk about for the moment, because you're going to hear arguments about the patterns in the data, and you're going to ask yourself, how good is the data? Just like the CNO asked, how good is the data? Well, if you go to our website, the Chicago Project on Security and Terrorism, you'll be able to answer quite a bit of that for yourself. Uh, and you can see we're still proud of the <laughs> Capitol Hill Conference, which we'll be probably moving away from pretty soon. Uh, but let me just uh, show you uh, our database, because I told you this is built largely around this first complete database of all suicide attacks around the world. How good is the data in the database? Well, just to uh, show you, um, uh, we now have about 2,200 attacks on the database, but let me just kind of uh, dip in a little bit. First, you're going to see uh, in our people page a large number of people that have been associated with the project. Uh, um, actually, many different aspects of the project. Here, I'm just showing you our native language speakers, uh, people who have been helping us collect information on suicide, on suicide attacks, not just in English, but in all the key native languages you would expect. Arabic, Hebrew, Tamil, Russian, Urdu. We could probably do any language at this point. We collect all the information that exists that we can find from the media, from the suicide terrorist groups themselves, from uh, governments under fire. We send people to Damascus, to Beirut, to Cairo. We collect all the primary information that we possibly can, and we're putting much of this actual information on the web. But as I said, how good is the data? Well, let me just show you uh, an example here. And I'm going to pick uh, Lebanon because many of you will be familiar with Hezbollah, the famous suicide terrorist groups from Lebanon. And if you search our database uh, since 1980, you'll see that there have been over, there have been, not over, there have been exactly 38 suicide attacks in Lebanon. And uh, how do I know it's 38? And you're going to also want to know how good is this data in just a moment. Well, of course, you can see summary statistics. And then you let your eye go down, and you can start to look at a list of attacks. And you start to look at, oh, there's view details. Well, we can view the detail of the very first attack. And you see, oh, well, again, very detailed information about who was killed, where, and also um, not just the target, but often the name of the suicide attacker, social economic data about the suicide attacker, very helpful to penetrate the language barrier to get this kind of information. But again, how good is the data? That's really the key question. At the bottom, you see sources. Um, every bit of data I'm going to talk about here tonight has been corroborated, corroborated. We don't use anonymous internet chat room data, uh, but corroborated by a minimum of two independent sources of data. Often we have four and five sources of data for each uh, uh, attack. But if you look again, you want to know how good is the data. Well, you don't just see footnotes in our database, but we actually go to the source itself. And we actually have put online for free, no $2,000 entry fee, <laughs> okay, um, online for free, the actual hard source information verifying what I'm going to tell you here today. Um, that's what the CNO is asking his staff to look at. That's why the government, uh, many of the intelligence communities have taken this quite seriously. Um, not as much uh, in the political world as we want. We're making progress, um, but the CNO was a start. Um, and, uh, but it's about how good is the data. This is probably the most reliable database. I suspect not just on suicide terrorism, but I dare say perhaps on terrorism, uh, because you can really be confident of the information that you're seeing. And by the way, if you think we've missed something, just send us a note, we'll follow up. We've got a team of people who are definitely wanting to do that. So what's in the database? 
I want to talk about the patterns in two parts. First, uh, from 1980 to 2003, think about that as uh, suicide terrorism around the world before the Iraq War. Then I want to talk about the world of suicide terrorism since 2004. So from 1980 to 2003, there were a grand total of 343 completed suicide attacks defined in the classic sense you would expect of an individual killing himself, himself, or herself, herself on a mission to kill others. And the world leader is not an Islamic group. They were the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka, a Marxist group, a secular group, a Hindu group. The Tamil Tigers did more suicide attacks than Hamas or Islamic Jihad. Further, a third of all Muslim suicide attacks were by purely secular groups such as the PKK in Turkey, which is another Marxist, read, anti-religious suicide terrorist group. And by the way, the PKK are still doing suicide attacks to this day. I was last in Turkey about 18 months ago. Uh, I went to Ankara to a NATO conference, and I also went to Bill Kent University, uh, which is also in Ankara. And the day before my, con uh, my, my talk there, there was a suicide assassination attempt by a PKK woman uh, against a government official. Uh, I'm actually going back in three weeks to Ankara to that conference again. Um, but it's, uh, uh, it is certainly the case that the PKK is alive and well. But what does this mean overall? Think about this for the conventional wisdom. The conventional wisdom is that suicide terrorism is a product of Islamic fundamentalism. But over half of all the suicide attacks in this period are not associated with Islamic fundamentalism. Instead of religion, what nearly all suicide attacks have in common since 1980 is not, is, is a specific strategic objective to compel a democratic state to withdraw combat forces. I don't mean advisors with sidearms. I mean tanks, fighter aircraft, and armor units threatening territory they consider to be their homeland or prize greatly from Lebanon to the West Bank then, and you will see, to Iraq and Afghanistan today, threatening this core territory is the central feature of every suicide terrorist campaign. This is the core logic of suicide terrorism. That is, it's a response to occupation. Now, as I said, this, doesn't, this pattern doesn't quite hold up for 100% of suicide attacks. It holds up for over 95%. Let's look at the nine disputes during this period from 1980 to 2003 that produced the 95% of suicide terrorist attacks during this period. There were nine disputes, and if you let your eye go up and down the middle, you'll see that territory, centrally important to each one of those campaigns. Let me pick the first, again, Lebanon, uh, to give you an example. In June 1982, Hezbollah did not exist. In June 82, Israel invaded southern Lebanon with 78,000 combat soldiers, 3,000 tanks and armor vehicles. One month later, Hezbollah was born. Then over the course of the next year, and for reasons we're still not quite sure about, Hezbollah began to experiment with suicide attack. And the fourth suicide attack was in October 83, the famous suicide truck bombing against our Marines in Beirut, killing 241 of our Marines. The same day, they did a suicide attack against French troops in Beirut. A few months later, Ronald Reagan, no pacifist, decided to withdraw all American combat forces from Lebanon rather than face another suicide attack. The French left the same day we left. That was cutting and running. Um, then, <laughs> couldn't resist. Uh, then, um, two years later, a few years later, Israel withdrew in 1986, first to a six-mile security zone in southern Lebanon. And then in May 2000, Israel withdrew its army from Lebanon altogether. And what's significant about the withdrawals is that Hezbollah suicide attackers did not follow the Americans to New York, or the French to Paris, or even the Israelis to Tel Aviv. Since May 2000, when Israel's army left, do you know how many suicide attacks Hezbollah has done, or any Lebanese? Zero. 
not even during the summer of 2006, when you'll remember there's this three-week air war between Israel and Hezbollah. Now, this is just about a bunch of Islamic radicals looking for any excuse for that quick trip to heaven. We should have seen hundreds of suicide attacks by Hezbollah in the summer of 2006, and we didn't see any. This is powerful evidence, not just the correlation evidence of the correlation of foreign occupation with suicide attack, but the timing, both in the onset of the suicide terrorism and then in the withdrawal of the occupation leading to the, to the decline of suicide terrorism. This is strong evidence about the causal factor at work. But what about 9-11? Uh, this research was the first to collect the complete set of the 71 individuals who actually killed themselves to carry out attacks for Osama from 1995 to 2004. Uh, those 71, we know the names, nationality, and other socioeconomic data of 67. Not quite all, but almost all. The largest number, 34, come from Saudi Arabia. The majority, the large majority, from the Arabian Peninsula, where the United States first began to station combat forces in 1990. It's important to underscore, even to an educated audience, that 1990 was the watershed year in our military deployment to the Arabian Peninsula. Yes, before 1990, we had a few hundred advisors with sidearms, mostly Marines standing in front of uh, an embassy, but no tanks, no fighter aircraft, no armor units going all the way back to World War II. Why did we put them in in 1990? To kick Saddam out of Kuwait. When did we do that? March 91, and then we never left. We kept between 10 and 30,000 combat forces stationed there every day from that point on, and Al-Qaeda suicide attacks start in 1995. But rather than, but notice also where Al-Qaeda suicide attackers are not coming from. Iran, surely an Islamic fundamentalist population with three times the population size of Saudi Arabia. No, Al-Qaeda, suicide attackers. Sudan, Sudan is an Islamic uh, country with a population about the same size as Saudi Arabia and with a brand of Islamic fundamentalism so congenial to Osama, he chose to live there for three years in the 1990s. No, Al-Qaeda, suicide terrorists. I could keep going, Bangladesh. We could just keep going through the largest Islamic fundamentalist populations and you would see Islamic fundamentalism is a poor predictor of who becomes an Al-Qaeda suicide terrorist. A much better predictor are Sunni countries where we've stationed combat forces. That's the key trigger. But rather than have me talk about this over and over and over, let's look at the Al-Qaeda terrorists themselves. I want to show you martyr videos from six of the most notorious Al-Qaeda suicide attackers. I'm going to show you four of the 9-11 hijackers. They're going to speak to you in Arabic, and you'll see their subtitles underneath uh, so that you can follow it. And I'm also going to show you two of the July 2005 London suicide bombers. Uh, they're Brits. Uh, they're going to speak to you in English. And to help you follow this, we're going to bookend them so that we'll have a London bomber first, then the four 9-11 hijackers, then another London bomber. This is how our ethical stances are dictated. Um, your de democratically elected governments continuously perpetuate atrocities against my people all over the world. And your support of them makes you directly responsible, just as I am directly responsible for protecting and avenging my Muslim brothers and sisters. Until we feel security, you will be our targets. And until you stop the bombing, gassing, imprisonment and torture of my people, we will not stop this fight. We are at war and I am a soldier. وأقول للقيادة الأمريكية إن أرادت سلامة جيوشها وشعبها فلتسحب جميع قواتها من بلاد المسلمين ولتخرج من جميع أراضيهم وإلا فلتنتظر الرجال 
ولتجهز توابيتها وتحفر قبورا لأبنائها ولتستعد لأن تذوق الويل والوبال القادم على قياداتها وشعبها بإذن الله وإن من المصائب العظام التي أصيبت بها الأمة الإسلامية هي احتلال بلاد الحرمين من قبل الجيوش اليهودية الصليبية وعلى رأسها أمريكا وإن هذا الاحتلال أكبر خيانة وكارثة في تاريخ الإسلام فلم تغز جزيرة العرب مثل هذه الجيوش الأمريكية الجبارة التي تنقر أساطيلها بحار الجزيرة وتضلل طائراتها سماء المنطقة وتدب فيارقها فوق ترابها أسألكم بالله تعالى ماذا يجري اليوم في بلاد المسلمين احتلال واضح لا غبار عليه وأنتم أيها العلماء تقولون هذا وتقرونه حتى لبلاد الحرمين كيف لا ونحن قد دهنا في بيت ربنا ومسجد نبينا وقبلتنا ومقدساتنا واحتللنا من قبل اليهود والنصارى وهي أعظم مصيبة بعد مصيبة وفاة الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم ومما يزيدها عظما أن هذا الاحتلال تم بالتعاون مع الحكام المرتدين وجزيرة العرب منذ أن خلق الله صحراءها وحفها ببحارها لم يدهمها مثل هذا البلاء قط فإنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وما بلاد الحرمين فيه من احتلال وتردي هو مخطط من اليهود والنصارى وعلى رأسهم أمريكا دمرها الله التي ما نزل بالإسلام والمسلمين من مصيبة إلا كانت سببا فيها What you have witnessed now is only the beginning of a series of attacks which inshallah will intensify and continue until you put all your troops out of Afghanistan and Iraq until you stop all financial and military support to the US and Israel and until you release all Muslim prisoners from Belmarsh and your other concentration camps and know that if you fail to comply with this then know that this war will never stop and that we are ready to give our lives 100 times over for the cause of Islam you will never experience peace until our children in Palestine, our mothers and sisters in Kashmir, our brothers in Afghanistan and Iraq feel peace. So what I'm saying is that foreign occupation is the smoking of suicide terrorism. Of the people who get lung cancer, 85% have smoked in their lives, smoked cigarettes. Of the societies bedeviled by suicide terrorism, 95% face foreign occupation. Now what is it about, and by the way, I mean that foreign occupation is the trigger that triggers both religious and secular suicide terrorists. That's the common root, taproot to both of those. Now what is it about foreign occupation? Well, it's not one thing, it's several things. Uh, one thing is revenge. Some suicide bombers are motivated by uh, the personal harm that's happened by occupation forces uh, to their close family members and friends. Uh, foreign occupation also can bring communities together. And what that means is those who die to defend that community might hope to become martyrs. They might hope to become heroes. The people on this video these martyr videos, you could think of those as hero videos. And who makes them the martyr or the hero? Not they themselves. They may wish to die as a martyr, but once they're dead, it's the communities who revere them as martyrs or not. And many of them actually are quite intensely. Also, foreign occupations tend to produce a sense of hopelessness. And hopeless populations tend to become religious. That is, it's no accident that foreign occupation and religion overlap because quite a few, quite a few of these individuals are becoming religious and more intensely religious under the foreign occupation. And what's happening again is not one of those micro causes, but numerous micro causes are being triggered by that phenomenon of foreign occupation. 
the sense by the local community that the foreign troops are controlling the governments and therefore the way of life of the population. Why do we know that we're occupying Afghanistan right now? It's not by the number of troops we have there. It's because we believe, the terrorists believe, and everybody in Afghanistan believes that if we left, Karzai would fall. <laughs> we're keeping the government of Karzai in power. That's the real threshold of occupation. And what that's doing is it's telling the local population we're controlling your future way of life, whether you like it or not. That's the true taproot of the problem that we face. Now, if this hypothesis is right, if it's true that foreign occupation causes suicide terrorism, then what should we see if we get more occupation, more suicide terrorism? Since 2004, there have been over 1,800 suicide attacks around the world. Remember, there were just 300 from 1980 to 2003, six times the number from 1980 to 2003 since 2004. And they're not scattered around the world. They're concentrated. They're concentrated tightly in the areas of foreign occupation. Now, for this hypothesis to be wrong, the link between foreign occupation and suicide terrorism, we would have had to have missed not just five suicide attacks, or even 50 suicide attacks. There would literally have to be hundreds of suicide attacks occurring somewhere around the world, not in areas at the bottom of this chart. I don't mean that we would have overcounted or undercounted Iraq by 200. I mean they'd have to be 200 occurring in Bangladesh, Mozambique, South Africa, Brazil. Um, and while I can't truly promise you our research team has got every single suicide attack, I, I don't think we've missed even five, however, but I can surely tell you we haven't missed hundreds. You would know if there are hundreds of suicide attacks that we have not missed. Moreover, notice the other key patterns since 2004. How many are anti-American in nature? In the year 2000, the year before 9-11, there were 20 suicide attacks around the world, one anti-American inspired against the U.S. coal. In the last 12 months, over 300 suicide attacks around the world. Well over 250 anti-American inspired, either against us or allies working directly for and with us. This is not a good pattern, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. This is not a good thing for Americans to have the weight of suicide terrorism so heavily anti-American. But let me show you uh, what's happened in some specific events, cam campaigns. Let me talk first about Iraq. Iraq is a prime example of the logic of suicide terrorism I've been telling you about here tonight. Before our invasion in March 2003, Iraq never experienced a suicide attack in its history. Then, since the invasion, you'll see that it goes up, goes up to 2007 where it peaks, and then it comes down, and it comes down in this distinctively two-step fashion. Why does it come down, and why in this distinctively two-step fashion? Uh, well, let me tell you a few things about this to explain it. Uh, first, during the war in Iraq, there was not one conflict, there were two conflicts going on side by side. The first conflict was a three-sided civil war. Ordinary attacks where Shia, Kurds, and Sunnis were all killing each other by ordinary means, side by side with the second conflict, which was Sunni suicide terrorism. In Iraq, there has not been a single Shia suicide terrorist or Kurdish suicide terrorist. Now think about that for a moment, especially the Shia. There's plenty of Islamic fundamentalist Shia. Sadr, the Badr Brigade, I mean, we have plenty of Islamic fundamentalist Shia. No suicide terrorists for Sadr. It was Sunni. Why is it Sunni? It's helpful to remember that Saddam wasn't just an evil dictator, he was a Sunni. When we toppled Saddam's government, we weren't just throwing him out of power, we we're throwing the Sunnis out of power. Who's then going to replace that Sunni government? Well, either an American government directly or a Shia-dominated government. Either way, 
It's the Sunnis who are most put out by that occupation. But why does it come down? Why is that Sunni suicide terrorism coming down, and especially, again, in that distinctive two-step fashion? Well, most people would say the first step, 2007 to 2008, ah, I know, Professor Pape, it's the surge. We put in 21,000 ground troops, and that is what brought down the Sunni suicide terrorism. Let's look and see if that's actually true. Uh, the Sunnis live in Anbar province. That's where they live. That's the Sunni triangle. And we can look at the numbers of troops across the country as a whole and in the province. And if we look from September 2006 to September 2008, that's the window of the surge, the first thing we can do is look at the country as a whole. For, that is U.S. and coalition troops in the country using the Pentagon's own numbers. These are the DOD numbers. And what you see is, for the country as a whole, the numbers go down. Well, how can that be? We surged 21,000 troops. Our allies were leaving faster. For the country as a whole, we were essentially backfilling for the, uh, uh, for the less of the allies. But wait a second. Maybe you'll say, well, wait a minute, Professor Pape. OK, it's true that our allies left fast and we're surging troops. But maybe we put them in Anbar. <laughs> and maybe that's what happened. And that's why the Sunni terrorism uh, goes down. Well, no, uh, they do grow. The number of troops in Anbar do grow from 34,000 to 38,000. But that's not where we put the troops. We actually put them in Baghdad. Um, and I could tell you stories about that. I was actually, by the way, you might find this a little paradoxical. I was in favor of putting uh, American combat forces temporarily in Baghdad to cap that volcano of the ordinary violence, uh, basically on moral grounds. I thought since we had triggered that civil war, it was up to us to put a cap on that volcano. Um, and so I actually liked sending some troops to Baghdad for a few months to put a lid on that. But notice how that's not what happened in Anbar. And if we were going to solve Anbar by the counterinsurgency manual, the Petraeus counterinsurgency manual that we published here at the University of Chicago, and I know it quite well because I was a reader for it. I actually advocated that they publish it, which was a little controversial at the time, too. So you notice it's <laughs> sometimes I take positions that are, uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> but if we looked at their numbers, the Petraeus numbers, the one to 50 ratio, one combat troop for every 50 of population we're supposed to defend, we should have had 100,000 troops in Anbar. We don't have anywhere near that number. No, what really changed in Anbar was the last column, the Sons of Iraq, also called Anbar Awakening. What essentially happened is we took 100,000 insurgents, terrorists, who were killing us or were trying to kill us, and we paid them $300 a month to do one thing, don't kill us. Now, we'd hope you'd go and get a job with that money. We didn't like it, but OK, you can go buy guns with that money. <laughs> and many did buy guns. Um, but the one thing you can't do if you want your next paycheck for $300 in the next month is kill us. Well, that was quite controversial at the time. Uh, that was a major change in our policy. And it was the major success in bringing down suicide terrorism uh, by the Sunnis, at least by about 50 percent, 40 some percent in that one year. And why is that? It's because when we gave those economic resources to the Sunnis and they bought guns with them, what were we doing? Strengthening their ability to defend themselves against, yes, against the terrorists, but also against us <laughs> and against the Shia-dominated governments. That's what it means to roll back the effects of an occupation to give that local community greater ability to perpetuate their own way of life independently of us. And that's what uh, helped uh, bring down terrorism so much. But still, but also then what happened the next year? So that was year one. It's helpful to remember that in November 2008, we followed up the Anbar Awakening by signing the withdrawal accords with the, uh, uh, the government in Baghdad. And we've now withdrawn over 100,000 troops in the last two years. Uh, in fact, our withdrawal is, if anything, slightly ahead of schedule. And when we were arguing about this two and a half years ago, what was the big argument that you heard? Oh, we couldn't possibly pull troops out. Oh, heaven forbid we'd pull troops out. Why? That would embolden 
the terrorists. We'd have a new caliphate on the Arabian Peninsula. What's happened? We're putting the terrorists out of business. That's cutting the fuse of the terrorist threat that really matters. Now, what happened in uh, Afghanistan? Afghanistan is another prime example of the logic of terrorism, suicide terrorism, that I'm showing you here tonight. Before we toppled the Taliban in, Mar in, in the fall of 2001, Afghanistan never experienced a suicide attack in its history. Then, for the first few years, notice how there's just a handful of suicide attacks, pretty minor. That was the period when it was the good war. You remember that? And then, suddenly, 2006, it spikes up. And it stays high for the next few years. And it stayed high, actually, in the last 12 months. It's not actually coming down. So why did it go up in 2006? What happened? Well, first, let's look at the targets of the suicide attack. The green are US and NATO troops. And as you can see, 85% of the attacks are against US and NATO troops. But why 2006? What led to this spike up in suicide attacks? Well, let's look at who's doing the suicide attacks. We can identify and corroborate the identity of 93 of the Afghan suicide attackers. Uh, we think that's quite a large number because last April, Army Intel from Kabul contacted us. They told us that they could, in their classified database, code about 50 and asked what we had. So we gave them our data. We don't get their data. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, that's the way it works. Um, but they told us the patterns were, quote, roughly comparable, whatever that means. Um, but what do you see in that pattern? You see 90% are Afghan nationals. And they're not just any Afghan nationals. They're Pashtuns. They're Pashtuns. Only 5% are from the border areas, nationals from the border areas of Afghanistan. And only another 5% are from outside the region of conflict. This is not a global jihad swirling around the world. This is regional opposition to Western military presence. That's what this model, that's what this data reflects. But why 2006? What happened in 2006 to cause Pashtuns to do suicide attacks against US and NATO troops? What happened? Uh, well, something with forces, but it's not a direct linear relationship. Uh, with, uh, because that concept, as I was defining for you, of occupation is not a linear concept. And it's not one troop equals one degree of occupation. Uh, but let's come back and look at the linear growth here. First of all, this is the curve of our force deployment in Afghanistan. First thing you notice is that Obama surge, Obama surge, that's just the last surge we've been doing. For the last few years, we've been surging 20,000 or more troops into Afghanistan every single year. Obama's just doing another round of the Bush surges. <laughs> so this is not new. Uh, and moreover, for those of you who are old enough to remember Vietnam, doesn't this really draw those uncomfortable parallels here with that steady incremental escalation in Vietnam? But if you look at the early years, 2001, 2002, and 2003, there's a small number of troops, Western troops there, but something far more important. They aren't scattered around the country. They're occupying just Kabul. You see, for the first few years of our occupation, we were so petrified that Karzai would be assassinated and had such a small number of troops that we were basically protecting him, literally his immediate security, and not going around the country as a whole. It wasn't until October 2003 that the UN gave us a mandate to spread our forces around the rest of the country. And the ISAF, that's the name of the Western military organization, uh, it's basically US and NATO troops, they developed a plan. And this is ISAF's actual plan, the actual map ISAF developed to occupy the rest of Afghanistan. And what do you see? Stage one. Go north, our friends, the Northern Alliance. Stage two, go west, more friends. And then what starts to happen, late 2005, early 2006, we're going to the south and the east. That's the Pashtun areas of Afghanistan, the badlands, so to speak. That's when we're directly occupying 
the Pashtun areas of Afghanistan. And those of you who know your ethnic geography, who lives on the other side of the border here in this area? That's Pakistan, and it's the other half. Thank you. <laughs> it's the, I guess somebody knows. It's the other half of the Pashtun homeland. You see, if I showed you the graphs for Pakistan, um, and by the way, all this is in gory detail developed in the book, so yeah, if you, um, uh, you would see that there is a spike up in suicide attacks in Pakistan, similar to Afghanistan, with a six-month lag. There it starts in late 06, continuing after 2007. What happened? What happened is, as we were directly occupying this half of the Pashtun homeland, in fall 2006, the United States put heavy pressure on Musharraf to take 100,000 Pakistani army troops that were defending Pakistan in the east from who's the number one threat to Pakistan? India. Remember, they almost had this little nuclear war in 2002. <laughs> We put pressure on Musharraf, basically broke both his elbows, um, to put those 100,000 troops on the western provinces of Pakistan, basically sitting on top of the Pashtun homeland. And since that time, 75% of all the suicide attacks in Pakistan have been against the Pakistani army troops in the western provinces of the country. Same time, of course, that's also caused Musharraf's legitimacy to plummet because he went from being our putative ally to our stooge. Why? Because we forced him to put Pac submerge Pakistan's number one security interest against India and put, take our interest uh, against the Taliban as the number one interest. That's what led to the problems there. And that's why, to this day, we have problems in Pakistan and with the Pakistani government. You may have noticed in the last year, we have these little problems. They cut off our resources sometimes, our flow to our troops. Why is that? They're not so happy about this relationship because their populations are not so happy about this and what it, has to, what it means for India. Now, so far, I've just been talking about the threat over there and the suicide terrorism in Iraq and Afghanistan as if it's a problem over there. But it's not just a problem over there. I'd like to show you how it connects with the problems here and how the terrorists use those events here to recruit homegrown terrorists to kill us. I want to show you what is probably the most important recruitment video Al-Qaeda has ever done. It's by Adam Gadon. Adam Gadon is the poster child for recruiting homegrown terrorists to kill us. Adam Gadon is an American citizen. He was born in Riverside, California. He's about 33 years old when his name is Adam. Uh, his father was Jewish. When the family was young, uh, the family converted to Christianity. And when he was a teenager, Adam converted to Islam. And since 1998, Adam has been living with Osama, either in Afghanistan or now, we believe, in the western parts of Pakistan. In 2006, his recruitment video came out to recruit terrorists to kill us, homegrown terrorists to kill us here at home. And I want to show you that video. Um, and just give me a second to call it up. It's crucial for Muslims to keep in mind that the American... And as you're listening to it, about two-thirds of the way through, I want you to remember the Fort Hood shooting spree. Crucial for Muslims to keep in mind that the Americans the British and the other members of the Coalition of Terror have intentionally targeted Muslim civilians and civilian targets, both before as well as after September 11th, uh, in both the first and second Iraq wars, as well as in their forays into Somalia uh, and the Sudan and Afghanistan, just to give you a few examples. And they've done this with the support and backing of their populations and electorates. I mean, even if there have been some feeble protests scattered here and there in the West, chiefly against the latest war in Iraq, all the same, the governments who started these wars have been re-elected by a majority of the popular vote. In their aggression against Afghanistan, which for Westerners 
and uh, their mercenary sympathizers is the least controversial of Bush and Blair's terrorist wars. They have targeted civilians for assassination and kidnapping. They kidnapped any non-Afghans they found and shipped them off to Guantanamo or worse. Many were handed over to the American and British-backed despotic regimes of the Islamic world to be brutally interrogated. And uh, with the blessing and support of that notorious Afghan killer, Hamid Karzai, they've murdered thousands of Afghan civilians as they slept in their beds, traveled on the roads, attended weddings, and prayed at the mosques. I know they've killed and maimed civilians in their strikes because I've seen it with my own eyes. My brothers have seen it. I've carried the victims in my arms, women, children, toddlers, babies in their mother's wombs. You name it, they've probably bombed it. I could go on and on, and that's just Afghanistan. We haven't talked about American and British atrocities in the two Iraq wars. Uh, let's take a look at the latest to be revealed. In uh, Mahmoudia, five American soldiers gang rape an Iraqi woman, and then to hide the evidence, murder her and three members of her family and burn her body. And then, when our Mujahideen take revenge on the unit which committed this outrage and capture and execute two of its members, they're called terrorists, and Muslims are supposed to uh, disown them or face the consequences. And I'm not saying that we should go and slaughter their women and children one by one like they did ours at Haditha and Ishaqi and Mahmoudia and, and God knows where else even if some of our legal experts have permitted that. And even if it's hard to imagine that any compassionate person could see pictures, just pictures of what, the, of what the Crusaders did to those children and not want to go on a shooting spree at the Marines housing facilities at Camp Pendleton. But I, what, what I am saying is that when we bomb their cities and civilians like they bomb ours, or destroy their infrastructure and means of transportation like they destroy ours, or kidnap their non-combatants like they kidnap ours, no sane Muslim should shed tears for them. And they should blame no one but themselves, because they're the ones who started this dirty war, and they're the ones who will end it, by ending their aggression against Islam and Muslims, by pulling out of our region, and by keeping their hands out of our affairs. And until and unless they do that, neither Forest Gate-style police raids, nor Belmarsh or Guantanamo prison cells, nor the mosques and imams of advisory council will be able to prevent the Muslims from exacting revenge on behalf of their persecuted brothers and sisters. So no 72 virgins. Hardly any discussion of Islam as a religion. From beginning to end, this is an empathetic plea to respond to the plight of kindred populations facing atrocities from a foreign occupation. This is what we're up against. This is why the Bush administration's so-called information war, the Madison Avenue war against terror, went nowhere. <laughs> this isn't about getting a few, Saudi, a, a few Saudi clerics to kind of declare terrorism immoral by Muslim Islamic standards. Uh, notice how also just electing Obama without changing policies, that's not going to deal with this. That's not going to deal with this. This is really rooted in the policy itself. If we're really going to, again, cut the fuse, stop suicide terrorism, that threat, we have to stop what motivates suicide terrorists to join in the first place. Suicide terrorists are not born in madrasas. They're not incubated in cells. They're not brainwashed in basements. They're walk-in volunteers. They're often not known at all to the suicide terrorist groups until the volunteers show up a few months, sometimes even just a few weeks, before there are suicide attacks specifically to do their suicide attack. We have to stop them before they start. How do we do that? We do that with a policy that um, uh, I've called offshore balancing. That is not with the policy of simply cutting and running, withdrawing our military forces and all troops from overseas. Uh, why do I say that? It's because I believe we have international interests and obligations around the world that we need to maintain. But nor should we simply stay and die and maintain large overseas presence, especially of ground forces. Why? Because it's that large overseas presence, that war on terror, that's producing more terrorists than it's killing.
Instead, we should rely on offshore balancing, which is air, naval forces, and if we ever need ground forces, rapidly deployable ground forces so they go in and out, not permanently or near permanently stationed onshore ground forces. And this isn't just a military concept. We should augment the military component with economic and political tools, much like we did in Anbar province, to rely on economic tools and political tools to empower the local populations. We often talk that talk, but actually, except for Iraq, we rarely walked that walk. That's the future that's likely to end the threat that we face. And I hope, uh, with your help, coming here tonight, you will spread the word about how to cut the fuse. So thank you very much. Go for it, Chicago, come on, we're used to it. <laughs> we don't have wolf hours at Chicago, it just doesn't happen. Can't a little good opportunity go to waste, can you hear me? I certainly can. Okay, um, well, uh, more recently, uh, and sort of more generally than uh, suicide terrorism, there's yep. suicide political opposition in many other countries, such as mm -hmm. a recent example in Tunisia. Yep. I wonder if you could extend your uh, remarks, your thoughts, yeah, it, I'm glad you asked. I think the events in Tunisia are actually interesting in a variety of ways. Um, uh, here we have um, a, a, a public actually bringing down one of the most repressive regimes. Uh, and by the way, Tunisia has often been called one of the worst regimes by Osama bin Laden. <laughs> so this has really been, uh, was really quite a thing. And maybe Twitter helped, I, I don't really know. Uh, but the specific issue of what happened with the self-immolation or someone setting themselves on fire, that political suicide, um, I don't actually break that out. I don't have that as part of our data set. It would be great, though, to have studies of this phenomenon because I think we would see a very interesting pattern here. Uh, and it's a pattern that what happened with that self-immolation, that person who became a hero, they weren't just simply respected as a hero for self-sacrifice, it triggered more self-sacrifice. That is, it was the beginning of a rising tidal wave, actually, in this case, uh, of self-sacrifice, which encouraged people to do what rational choice theorists tell us people won't do, <laughs> take risks for others. <laughs> in other words, it solved the collective action problem. Another way to think about this for folks who know these theories is that it played a non-trivial role in solving a collective action problem that otherwise we don't have a good explanation for. Now, how often does that happen? How powerful is it? We actually, I can't really tell you we have excellent studies of this. I can tell you we should have them, and I hope we will. But let me show you how comparable it is uh, to suicide attack, in some cases anyway. Who are the very first suicide attackers in recorded history? They're the Jewish zealots and Zakari of the first century AD. Now, of course, first century, there are no explosives, right? Uh, a Jewish zealot would take a Zakar, which was a knife, uh, remember, uh, in the first century AD, uh, uh, the uh, Jewish lands are under Roman occupation. The Jewish zealot would take the knife, go up to a Roman centurion, often in a square, say in Jerusalem, pull the knife out, slit the throat of one of the centurions, knowing and expecting the others would stab him to death on the spot, hoping that in the fight, the melee, that would produce an uprising. And according to Josephus, our historian of the Jewish War of 66 AD, one of those attacks is what triggered the famous Jewish War of 66 AD that led to all those consequences down the road. In other words, very similar to what happened uh, uh, in Tunisia. I just uh, haven't really focused on that particular element of how you actually produce popular revolts to occupations um, because, uh, again, I just, um, I've only focused on the suicide element. Excellent question. And maybe some of the graduate students in the room will hear that, yes, we need more work. We always see relatively young and healthy people as suicide yep. terrorists. And 
what about old and sickly people who really have nothing to lose? Yes. <laughs> Where are they in this? Do you have numbers? As oh, to yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, uh, we have, we've got uh, pretty good demographic data. Um, so this is a good question. And just show you how good the question that is. Um, I've given this talk um, uh, over the years, actually, a couple times. And I just gave it last May to Gary Becker's Rational Models Workshop. Gary Becker is our leading economist. And economists have theories for ordinary suicide. Who should commit ordinary suicide if you take the welfare individual perspective? People who are old, who don't have much future welfare to. Yes, I, I know, Paul, it's a, but this is the theory. Um, and so uh, they ask the same question, which is, wait a minute, the suicide attackers are simply too young. Well, point number one, it is true that about 80%, it's right at 80% of suicide attackers are in their 20s. Um, uh, it's also true, um, however, that we have quite a range. The youngest in our database that we can corroborate is 15. Uh, she's a woman. Uh, 15 is the youngest. Um, the oldest, again a woman interestingly enough, is 63. She's a grandmother who did a suicide attack for Hamas. We actually have her martyr video, um, and you can actually watch her talk about uh, this and how she hopes her grandchildren will respect her actions for what she sees as standing up to uh, Israeli occupation of the, uh, uh, of the West Bank. But by the way, notice how uh, that's spread, although there's some tales to this, the 80%. Who tends to sign up to be warriors and fight for our country? Not people who are 45, not people who are 55, not even people who are really 35. <laughs> um, people who are in their early 20s, late teens. It's the same basic range. Uh, a similar pattern also, by the way, happens with women. Some people ask me a lot of questions about women, which I'm glad to, to answer. Uh, but um, one of the key patterns is that about 20% of suicide attacks, about 17%, are actually women. Uh, how many of our armed forces today in the United States are women? 20 percent, 20 percent. So it's really not out of line with what you would expect for military behavior overall. Yes, sir. So I think one of like the, uh, the points I've taken away from this is that terrorists tend to attack people for occupying their land, as in mm -hmm. Iraqis in Iraq or Iraq. Or of kindred populations, right? Their land, national um, ter suicide terrorists are by far the most, but there's another fraction that do it to help a kindred group. Okay, well that's kind of my question. Yep. Is um, like to what extent do you think is like there's a regional or ideological motivation from the um, Israeli policies in Palestine? Oh, from Israel specifically. Um, actually, I think that it's far less than most people. Mo a lot of quote terrorism experts will tell you, and, and even non-terrorism experts, that they think that the root of all this is uh, American support for Israel. Um, I just don't find that. Um, I don't find that not because I'm wedded for or against Israel. Um, it's because, uh, let's take, um, uh, it's not, by the way, that Israel hasn't faced suicide terrorism. Of course they have. Um, but let's take Al-Qaeda. Um, there have been over 30 attacks that bin Laden has specifically claimed uh, um, uh, since 1995. Um, and how many of those have been against Israel? Zero. <laughs> Zero. Um, how often do we have um, basically uh, an airliner taking off from Cairo and trying to ram a building in Israel? We just don't have it happen. Certainly not. It's just not that common. Uh, we just we haven't certainly had that. And what I'm trying to tell you is not that there's a lot of love for Israel. <laughs> I'm not telling you that. Uh, what I'm telling you is I don't think the centerpiece of what's happening with Osama bin Laden is coming from Israel. I think it's coming from the Arabian Peninsula. Those 9-11 hijackers are really heavily focused on the Arabian Peninsula. Those four folks are Saudis. Um, the Arabian Peninsula is where the heavy energy comes. That's where the timing can be explained because that's when we occupied the Arabian Peninsula, when we get uh, the suicide terrorism. Uh, from Al-Qaeda, and I think that uh, that's where it will end. Either we reduce the combat forces on the Arabian Peninsula, or we're going to continue to face problems from Al-Qaeda. So I don't really see it coming as rooted in the Israeli problem. Why does it Israel come up at all? I mean, after all, in bin Laden's statements, he's often anti-Zionist, uh, uh, he's often uh, anti-Semitic. This may sound, uh, you know, sort of hard to hear, but um, in the Middle East, being anti-Israel, is the position of the median voter. 
The median person in the Middle East does not want Israel to stay there. If you were bin Laden and you were trying to lead people at all from that part of the country, and you were not <laughs> anti-Israel, there would be something weird about your positions. Yeah, Albert. Hey. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the educational and my religious processes, uh, suicide bombers uh, go through, uh, like how they're raised and how they become to be, how they come to be like suicide terrorists at the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, in our database, so um, in particular that period from uh, 1980 to 2003, we um, did a really extensive look at the 400, there were 462 suicide terrorists who actually killed themselves on those 343 attacks during that period. And we did a really detailed look to see exactly what was happening there. Um, only five came from madrasas. Five? I mean, think about that for a moment. Uh, almost none of the suicide attackers in Pakistan that we can at least code and identify and track back have come from madrasas. Uh, there are thousands of madrasas in Pakistan. Thousands. And they've been there for many decades. Many decades. Many madrasas in Pakistan, you just may be interested to know, are actually Sufi. Sufis are essentially a quiet, they're Islamic fundamentalists to be sure, but they're a quietest version of Islamic fundamentalists. Um, a lot of Islamic fundamentalists, in other words, are just very intensely interested in being religious, not very active. So actually, we don't have um, what most people think, which is that this pattern of people being like incubated in a, uh, a school, a cell, to turn them into, quote, the jihadi suicide attackers. Uh, I'm not trying to tell you you can't find um, videos on you know, YouTube. I'm not trying to tell you you can't find videos of uh, the school for jihadis. What I am trying to tell you is you can't find them, certainly not very often, not beyond a couple percent, as actual suicide attackers. Um, that's not where they tend to come from. They really tend to come from those walk-in volunteers um, who are just most often upset by the local circumstances they find with the occupation, those three patterns I pointed out. And when the occupation goes down, those madrasas are still there. Those religious schools are still there. But the suicide attackers dry up. How can that be if it's a product of that internal uh, indoctrination? Do you, do you see what I mean? Yes, sir. And you're from the lab school? Yes. Yeah, excellent. So and why are you here? Uh, I was interested, but I also got extra credit. You actually got extra credit. From whose class? <laughs> from my history class. By, taught by? Ms. Shapiro. Oh, great. Tell Ms. Shapiro, I, I, uh, is she here? Oh, hi, Ms. Shapiro. Yeah, she had my son, Jonathan. <laughs> So you've given Lebanon as an example, but since 1982 and since 1986, Hezbollah has grown there in strength, even though Israel has withdrawn yep. forces from them. So could you explain why is it that even though Israel has withdrawn forces from Lebanon, Hezbollah is still very strong, and why, yes. how could that apply to the U.S. withdrawing troops from. Yep, absolutely. Um, I think that the core. I think the core. The core question here is: um, since 1986, it's true, Professor Pape, suicide attacks in Lebanon are going down, uh, but it's also true, side by side with that, Hezbollah seems to be becoming a stronger factor in the country. Uh, and why is that? And also notice that, by the way, um, I could tell you a similar story with the decline of the Palestinian suicide terrorists. Anybody remember the last Palestinian suicide terrorist? It's been a few years, right? What happened to the Palestinian? We certainly have a lot of Islamic fundamentalists. Hamas hasn't gone away. And in fact, Hamas has become a stronger factor inside of uh, the West Bank since then in a somewhat similar way. So yes, as occupation has declined, something has come up. Uh, has, uh, and why is that? Uh, number one, it's certainly the case that both Hezbollah and Hamas uh, claim to be the vanguard protectors of the population, so they expect credit for that. But more fundamentally, I think, especially in the case of Hezbollah, uh, and so secondarily in the case of Hamas, but certainly in the case of Hezbollah, is economic flows. What's happened, especially since May 2000, but during the entire period of uh, Israeli occupation, is that we had almost no Western economic flows going into southern Lebanon. We had lots of refugees. We had lots of people who were hurt very badly in southern Lebanon. And what happened? That created an opportunity 
for Iran to funnel millions of dollars to refugees for actual charitable purposes, <laughs> okay? And what did that do? Build tremendous community support for Hezbollah. Now, if Rahm Emanuel wants Obama to help him get community support here in Chicago, how might he do that? Federal flows <laughs> into uh, certain neighborhoods in Chicago. That might pay off, right? <laughs> um, that's what happened in the case of Lebanon. And in the case of uh, Hamas, one of the non-trivial factors here, uh, some claim it's even the dominant factor, I tend to think it's the secondary factor, in the rise of Hamas was the corruption of Fatah, the corruption of the political alternative. So that what we're seeing here is that if, in fact, what we do when we withdraw combat forces is walk away economically, and actually try to shut off economic flows to the region, for God forbid some you know, tiny, you know, uh, um, you know, a penny might fall into the hands of Hezbollah, we open up the door to far more difficult problems because others will step in and fund where we don't. And I think what we should do is be much more aggressive in using economic aid, the economic tools, and I would do it even in southern Lebanon, even to this day. I'd compete with Iran dollar for dollar rather than just letting Iran walk away with the store. Mike. This is the most uh, 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 national security knowledgeable doctor <laughs> I know of at the University of Chicago hospitals uh, who I've known for 30 years and who always, always comes up with a decisively hard question. <laughs> Oh, oh, I know I'm shot. <laughs> the first is uh, there have been more suicide campaigns than you have outlined here, and there have been other policy responses oh. than those you have outlined here. Some, Could yes. you review them and some alternatives to what you propose here for the group? Uh, and yes. The second question is uh, why is it that as ISAF expanded through Afghanistan that there was no similar response uh, in the north by the Tajiks or the Uzbeks, or in the west by the Persians or Iranians, uh, to mm -hmm. the expansion and occupation mm -hmm. of that territory by Western military forces. Yeah. Um, I think that as, let me take the Afghanistan question first, because that's where we've left off. So the key thing that's helpful to know about um, Afghanistan is that, remember in, I told you the story about uh, October 2003 when we, uh, the UN gave us a mandate to expand forces around Afghanistan? Well, let me just carry that story a little bit further because in January 2004, um, we went uh, further and that's when we took, a took Afghanistan we, uh, who had never been a democracy, we wrote a constitution for Afghanistan, uh, essentially, this is putting a little crudely, in the White House, um, and then we brought a loyal Yurga together of 1,000 Afghanis and paid the money to vote for it. <laughs> um, and then they did vote for it in January 2004. Now, at first blush, you say, oh, that's not a bad thing. We've got to get a democracy started somehow, and we had some elections. But let me tell you a little bit about something that's really interesting about that. Uh, about that uh, constitution. This is, the, this is a very strange democratic constitution uh, because it does have elections, but it has all the power of the central government centralized in the presidency, in Karzai. There's no check and balance system like we have in the United States. Uh, and that's why when Karzai was accused of corruption and fraud in the August 2009 elections, notice how there was no movement by parliament to stop him from being put in office. Why? They have no power to stop him by the Constitution. <laughs> so, uh, what, so remember uh, in the case of 2000 with Bush and Gore, when we had this problem, where was it going to end up being resolved? In Congress. They don't have that power in Afghanistan. Worse, the Supreme Court in Afghanistan does not have the power to check Karzai. Let me go further. What that means is that Karzai also has some additional powers that uh, what, what, also in this, Afghan, in this constitution that we don't have here. Not only is there the absence of a check and balance system, but Karzai has the power to appoint provincial governors and district governors. This would be like Obama having the power to pick the next mayor of Chicago directly 
without us getting a vote. Now, some of us are unhappy about it as it is, <laughs> let alone, um, uh, well, I don't know if we're unhappy exactly. We're, we're, we're not sure, perhaps. But we certainly would be unhappy if Obama was literally picking and we didn't even have a say and the, co the government itself couldn't serve as a check and balance. So what Karzai has been doing, if you have the power to do that with all the provinces and all the districts, is that he's been going around supporting various Tajik warlords, Hazari warlords. He's been basically playing the game of how do you maximize your direct political control. And it turns out in the Pashtun areas, he's decided to support political leaders from minority tribes because what he wants in the Pashtun areas is not the majority Pashtun tribes to control the local area, because after all, if they get too much power, they may not need him. <laughs> what he wants is a minority Pashtun tribe that needs him as much as he needs them. So that's what's why you're getting the balance that you're getting and why there is some worry if time goes on and Karzai gets too um, uh, aggressive uh, and appoints the wrong governors, you may have a massive expansion of this problem, a massive expansion beyond the Pashtun area. Anyway, that's, uh, and there's a whole story about Somalia, which I'll, I'll come back to Mike at some point, but that's, that's the Afghanistan story. Okay. Are there any good reasons to occupy a country such as to prevent ethnic cleansing yes. preemptively, like I mean, if we yep. invaded Germany in the 30s, maybe we would have some Nazi suicide uh, people, but we wouldn't have a lot of other bad things. Uh, yes, sir. There, there may well be good reasons to occupy countries in the future. Um, if it were to be the case, for instance, that I don't think this is at all likely, but I'll just say this. Uh, if it were to be the case that Iran developed a nuclear weapon, um, and then gave that weapon as a handoff to terrorists, uh, then Professor Pape, um, if those two things happened, would be leading the charge to occupy Tehran. Uh, that, would be, that would be beyond, and why would I do that? Not because of what I'm finding here, but because there would be counterbalancing reasons uh, which would encourage me, at least I think that would probably be where I'd come out, um, to, um, uh, to, be, uh, to say, yes, in the short term, we have to put aside the concern on suicide terrorism for that greater national security risk. Now, I would do all I could, and I argue uh, we could talk about this, about what we should do to prevent that from ever happening, which I think is highly unlikely anyway. Um, but let me say another issue, which is mentioned ethnic cleansing. I thought it was terribly important to take 20,000 troops and deploy them to Baghdad in uh, 2007. I thought this was important enough to write an op-ed about it in the New York Times. So I've written 10 op-eds in the New York Times in the last few years. Um, and there was a thing called the Iraq Study Group. You may remember, Obama was on this. This was in the fall of 2006. And the New York Times, when it came out in November 2006, they called me up and they said, uh, Bob, would you be interested in writing a comment on uh, the Iraq Study Group? And of course, they expected me to say, oh, this is great, we're getting out, and dot, dot, dot. And instead, <laughs> what I said was, yes, it's true that we should leave in fairly short order, but over the next few months, it was critical to cap the volcano of the violence that was happening inside of Baghdad, where nearly 3,000 civilians were dying every month. And I thought it was important for moral grounds. I thought it was important because we ba that, those deaths were basically at our doorstep. Uh, I also think that uh, that may, um, there, there, you could argue about strategic grounds down the road, but um, so uh, I think that yes, there can be countervailing reasons why you would quote, do some occupation either in the short term or in a bigger way. Um, but those would be, as you could tell, quite rare circumstances. Last one. Um, has the average age as well as the number of women involved in suicidal terrorism been changing in a steady pattern since 1980? Or has it been more just changing from group to group? Oh, excellent, excellent. Um, yeah, there's a uh, really awesome study of female suicide terrorism published by uh, one of our graduate students. Her name is Lindsay O'Rourke. Uh, you can go to our website. You can read it online. Uh, she looks at 110 female suicide terrorists, tells you all kinds of great things about it. One of the most important things, though, is her question. It's a very, uh, very smart question. Ms. Shapiro, you're, you have great students. <laughs> um, is uh, that unlike most reporters who call me up, um, uh, she's obviously aware that uh, there's some history to female suicide terrorism. 
female suicide terrorism really gets started in Lebanon in 1984. March 84 is the very first female suicide attack. Um, uh, and um, it is something, there were six from 1982 to uh, 1986, there were 38 uh, suicide uh, uh, attacks during that period. Six of them were done by women. Um, and their average age was 24. Uh, yes, there was a young girl who was 16, and she's very well known because she's often put up as the poster child of all female suicide terrorists. Uh, the idea that she had a boyfriend and was talked into it by her boyfriend, um, that may or may not uh, uh, you know, uh, have happened in her case, but it's certainly the outlier. It's not the norm. Uh, the average female suicide terrorist is 24 years old. Uh, they're quite mature. Um, many of them, um, by the way, are doing it for secular groups. Uh, so the, uh, the key thing that predicts whether or not you get female suicide terrorists is whether the group is secular or religious. The more Islamic fundamentalists the group, the less they'll take the women. And keep in mind, suicide terrorism is a phenomenon of people volunteering. The suicide terrorist groups are picking, they're recruiting. <laughs> and um, uh, that's why um, in Palestine, the first female suicide terrorist didn't occur until January 2002. Her name was Wafa Idris. And she first went to Hamas, Sheikh Yassin, and said, um, could I do uh, this martyrdom operation? He turned her down flat. <laughs> why? Because he said the Quran forbade may, uh, female warriors. She went to Yasser Arafat. He was glad to take her. He was a socialist. <laughs> and she became the first of his, quote, army of roses. And then, six months later, the fifth female suicide terrorist did it for Hamas. In their intervening period, Sheikh Yassin found an interpretation where, yes, there are conditions. <laughs> Um, but overall, the more secular the group, say the PKK in Turkey, 70% are women. 